welcome to the 2012-2013 Jonathan I. Charney Distinguished Lecture in Public International Law. I'm Ingrid Wirth. I'm Professor of Law and Director of the International Legal Studies Program here at Vanderbilt. Um, for our guests here who are not from Vanderbilt, let me give you a heartfelt welcome. So I'd like to thank Faye Johnson for her hard work. In fact, she's working so hard, she's probably not even in this room <laughs> uh, right now. Anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Faye Johnson uh, for her very hard work on organizing this event. And I'd also like to recognize Mike Newton. Uh, he's uh, a professor here at Vanderbilt, for those of you who don't know. And he's one of the world's leading experts on international criminal law. And he is responsible for bringing our distinguished speaker to Vanderbilt today. Uh, professor Jonathan Charney was the Lee S. and Charles A. Spear Professor of Law here at Vanderbilt until he passed away, unfortunately, in 2002. For those of you who don't know his name, Professor Charney was and remains today one of the intellectual giants in the field of public international law. He was brilliant. Students take note. He was brilliant. Uh, but he was also hardworking. Uh, and he was incredibly committed to his field. Uh, he continues to be a great credit to our law school and to the entire community of public international law. And we are very grateful to his family for their support of this event. Professor Charney uh, was a scholar of many things. He has an enviable scholarly record, but he was a scholar of international courts and tribunals, uh, including the International Criminal Court, uh, making the topic of today's lecture especially appropriate. So it is now my distinct and great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Professor Fatou B. Bensouda, who assumed her position as prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in June of this year. She is an amazingly distinguished attorney. She is an expert in international maritime law. She has served as a solicitor general, attorney general, and minister of justice in the Gambia. And she has served in the prosecutor's office at the ICC since 2002, earning extraordinary high praise and great respect for her intellect and judgment alike. The position she now holds is the single most powerful and important job in the world for assuring accountability for gross violations of human rights. As the first woman and the first African to hold this position, many of us will look to her for leadership on gender and racial issues. She is also, however, the face of accountability for all of the state parties to the International Criminal Court, and in some ways for all of us, for all of humanity. She has more than nine years to serve on the court, and the world is eagerly awaiting her leadership as she seeks accountability for terrible crimes, uh, ones that truly destroy human dignity and that tear apart families and societies. Uh, please joining, join me in welcoming uh, Prosecutor Bensouda. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. And I thank you all also for being here this afternoon. But allow me to thank um, the university, Vanderbilt University Law School, for inviting me. In particular, I want to recognize Professor Michael Newton's effort in getting me here. Um, and I'm looking forward to our discussions uh, this morning, afternoon. A little bit of jet lag, but I think it's morning. Um, I would like to introduce to you today the idea of a new paradigm in international relations, which was introduced by the work of the drafters of the Rome Statute and the establishment of the International Criminal Court. This idea is that of law as a global tool to contribute to world's peace and security. And this idea first surfaced with the belief that the power of law has the capacity to redress the balance between criminals who wield power and victims who suffer at their hands. Law provides a power, provides power for all 
regardless of their social or economic or political status. It is the ultimate weapon that the weak have against the strong. Indeed, when law is implemented and implemented equally and implemented fairly, the law sets one standard for all, for everyone. It empowers all communities and individuals and provides justice for all. It does not allow any individual or any segment of society to override or manipulate the order for individuals' gains. If it is backed, therefore, by, by sound institutions, and in the, in the domestic context, this is what we have tried to do. We have created institutions such as parliament. We have created institutions such as the police, prosecutors, and we've done this as well as courts to be able to establish law and order. But what about at the international context? How are we supposed to counter and prevent massive crimes of an international character such as genocide, such as war crimes, such as crimes against humanity, such as the crimes that are taking place in Darfur or have taken place in Cote d'Ivoire or even in Libya? How do we prevent that? Again, I say it's institutions. The need for institutions, more comprehensive institutions of international character. We need to duplicate what we are doing at the domestic level, also at the international level. And states that have participated in the drafting of the Rome Statute creating the International Criminal Court, they also had a reflection of this idea that a judicial institution to contribute to the prevention of massive atrocities by adding an independent and a permanent justice component to the effort that the world is taking to achieve peace and security. In order to be governed by the force of law, not by the law of force. This is a quotation I'm, I'm, I'm saying from William Sloan Coffin. We need such institutions, these institutions to act as an enforcer of the fight against massive crimes. I believe in the power of the law as a potent tool to stop and prevent violence. And peace, lasting peace, is a consequence of law and order. I will thus suggest a model of law as a three prong tool for achieving lasting peace. Firstly, it is a tool to protect citizens and territories. It's also a tool to address the wrongs done to victims, and it's also a tool to define unacceptable behavior, unacceptable criminal behavior that cannot lead to maintaining or acquiring power. But let me start with the notion of law as a tool of protection. The most important function of the rule of law, both in the international and also at the, in the domestic context, is to provide protection to individuals. In the domestic settings, citizens are protected by laws established by domestic institutions. And with the advent of the International Criminal Court, the individuals that are the nationals of the state's parties to the Rome Statute are protected not only at the domestic level, but they are also protected at the international level, the citizens of the state's parties. And today, 2.4 billion people, 2.4 billion people are under the protection of the Rome Statute system of global justice against oppression and repression by the powerful. But however, it is important to note that states themselves 
benefit from the protection and the activities of the International Criminal Court as well. The composition of the court, the court states parties, reveals the fundamental benefits that it provides. Today, our 121 states, they come from three regions that have taken the lead in terms of international justice efforts. And these regions are Africa, Europe, and South America. Their decision to promote the international rule of law is not just based on idealism. It is, in fact, a matter of realism. Because these regions have suffered. They have suffered from massive crimes. And eventually, they came to realize that a national state acting alone cannot protect its citizens from these crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Because these are crimes, these are massive crimes that cannot be confined within national borders. And Europe has seen how massive crimes have spilled over during the era of the Nazi regime and the Balkan conflicts. South America and Africa have also witnessed similar atrocities throughout the period of the Cold War. In fact, Africa suffered the Rwanda genocide, which resulted in the death of almost one million people, and the flows of refugees from Rwanda into Tanzania and in, into Congo. And this exodus of people is the root cause of the Congo Wars that we still see today. And these wars have caused the deaths of four million people and still counting. And even today, as we speak, sexual violence occurs as a result of these conflicts and reaches unspeakable levels. Today, preventing repetition of these experiences is of utmost importance and is a strategic priority for the states within these regions. But in order to tap the full potential of the court, the International Criminal Court, we have to maximize its preventive impact. We have to do this around the globe. The answers to the questions I asked before about stopping the genocide in Darfur, how to prevent a new cycle of violence during the next elections in Kenya, they lie with the preventive impact of the court. And since the inception of the International Criminal Court, the Office of the Prosecutor has opened investigations, and we have brought cases in seven situations. Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Republic, Darfur, Kenya, Libya, and Cote d'Ivoire. We are also engaged in a number of preliminary examinations, which could lead to investigations or not. And this is taking place in Honduras, in the Republic of Korea, in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Guinea, Colombia, Georgia, and most recently in Mali, where the government of Mali has requested the court to intervene. The effects of these cases, I think, reverberate across the world. For instance, in March of this year, the court rendered its decision against Thomas Lubangadilo, and they found him guilty. The unanimous decision of the court found him guilty of enlisting, conscripting, and using children under the age of 15 to fight crimes. But even before the decision came in March, the trial process and the fact that he was charged with these crimes had helped to trigger debates on child soldiers and also on child recruitment in countries that are very far away from the Democratic Republic of Congo where these crimes took place. Like in Colombia, there were debates, or in Sri Lanka, for instance. 
And the effects of the verdict that we have received in March were indeed global. Because Nepal, which also is very far away from the DRC, and Somalia have started taking measures against the conscription of children. And this is, this is the effect of what the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon always uh, has depicted and always refers to it as the shadow of the court. This is the preventive impact of the court. And this is a perfect example of how the law can be used to prevent and deter crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, when efforts to prevent massive crimes fail, the law can be used as a fundamental tool to redress the rights of victims. The, the court and the office of the prosecutor have been actively working for victims since the start of our activities. They are our primary beneficiaries and their well-being is our utmost concern. The Rome Statute establishing the ICC recognizes the rights of victims of massive crimes and provides these individuals who have been ignored so far with an opportunity to be represented against powerful individuals, those individuals wielding substantial military and political control. And on this basis, the Rome Statute paved the way for two landmark evolutions which I would like to share with you. First, it is a commitment, a commitment of the international community to take responsibility for the protection of victims of the most serious crimes. And this is should national systems fail to do so. Should they fail to uphold this responsibility that they have, the international community have taken this commitment. And to achieve this goal, the statute gives a mandate to an independent prosecutor to investigate and prosecute the crimes, protecting the rights of victims, respecting their interests, and contributing to reparation. The second landmark evolution is that it empowers victims as actors in the international criminal justice system with a right to express their views and concerns, with a right to participate, expressing their views and concerns independently by giving them a voice in the proceedings where, where it is found that their personal interests are affected. During the Lubanga trial, the representatives of victims were sitting right next to the prosecutor's office. And they were seeking from the court um, uh, opportunity to, 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 actually it's not opportunity, it's a right. They were asking for their right to be heard, to present their views, and also to participate in the proceedings. So the framework that has been established in the Rome Statute regarding victim participation represents a key innovative feature of this court and is a milestone in international criminal justice. It is part of a consistent pattern of evolution in international law, included but not limited to international criminal law, which recognizes victims as actors and not only as passive subjects of the law, granting them specific rights. And this is what we have been doing as an office of the prosecutor, as a court, for millions of victims who have suffered massive crimes in Uganda, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Central African Republic, in Darfur, in Kenya, in Libya, and in Cote d'Ivoire. And we have done it with a strong conviction and also a strong cooperation of the African states. And we have also benefited from the commitment and support of our partners within the African civil society. However, this unfortunately is not the story that is relayed in the media. And again and again, we hear criticisms about our so-called Africa bias, our so-called focus on Africa. 
and also about the court, ICC being an anti-African court. Anti-ICC elements who often have personal reasons for trying to discredit the court have been working very hard to damage the court and its work by lobbying for non-support with complete disregard for legal arguments. And with due respect, what is very offensive really is when you hear criticisms about this so-called Africa bias that we talk about and how easily we get distracted by the words of a very few um, powerful, influential individuals. And then we forget about the millions of anonymous people that suffer and continue to suffer under their oppression. Indeed, the greatest affront to victims of these brutal, unimaginable crimes, the women, the young girls, women and young girls raped, families brutalized, robbed of everything, entire communities terrorized and shattered, is to see these powerful individuals, these few of them, who are responsible for their sufferings, trying to portray themselves as the victims of a pro-Western, anti-African court. Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, has poignantly stated some time back that leaders need to choose their sides, whether they are on the side of the victims or whether they are on the side of the oppressors. The court has chosen the side of the victims. As prosecutor, I have chosen the side of the victims. And justice, and I mean real justice, is not a pick and choose system. To, uh, to be effective, to be just, and to have a lasting impact, justice has to be guided solely by the law and by the evidence. And our focus as a, as a court, our focus as an inter, uh, um, office of the prosecutor is on individual criminal behavior against innocent victims. My focus in, is on the likes of Joseph Coney. Joseph Coney has been committing crimes for over 20 years now. My focus is on Boscon Taganda. Boscon Taganda is no less, uh, Joseph Coney is no less dangerous than Boscon Taganda. There is a warrant out for Boscon Taganda. It has not been executed. My focus is on Ahmed Haroun in, in Sudan, Darfur and on Omar al-Bashir, who continues to be the president of Sudan. And the office of the prosecutor will go where the victims need us. In the words of Governor Roy Banz, he said, law is a shield for the powerless, not a club for the powerful. And no one is going to divert me from the course of justice and the service to victims. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the world increasingly understands the role of the International Criminal Court. But Africa understood it right from the start. And as Africans, we know that impunity is not an academic idea. It is a reality which affects the everyday lives of millions of Africans. And consequently, the African commitment to ending impunity is a reality, and we have to find a way to focus our attention on that. Indeed, international justice gives power of leadership to small and medium countries, to principal states, those who are not determined, those who are determined to use the power of the law, not the power of arms, to protect their citizens and their territories. Political leaders can lead efforts for international justice in the global arena by supporting the ICC. Senegal was the first country to ratify the Rome Statute in 2002 after the then president, Abdujouf, president of Senegal, facilitated meetings in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, in 1998, which led to the Rome Conference establishing the ICC. South Africa 
refused to invite President Omar al-Bashir to the inauguration of President Zuma in 2009. The government of Botswana and its president, President Kama, have consistently expressed their strong support for the work of the court. And just recently, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Zambia stated that President al-Bashir would regret the day he was born, these are his words, if he tried to go to Zambia. And the last African Union summit, which was supposed to be held in Malawi, was reorganized to be held in the AU headquarters in Addis Ababa due to the Malawian president, Joyce Banda, when, he, when she talked about her commitment to arrest President Bashir in case he stepped foot on Malawi territory. These countries, these leaders, are leading the pursuit of international justice. The ICC sets a very clear and a basic limit, which is violence means, violent means cannot be employed against civilians to gain or to retain power. These leaders have understood, they've understood this and they have factored in in their relations with others. Cases in Kenya and in Cote d'Ivoire are warnings, they're sounding, sounding a warning. But let me conclude. The ICC, ladies and gentlemen, is a powerful new tool to control violence in the world, to deter crimes, to pro promote national proceedings. But it can only be successful if we never yield to political considerations. We are a new tool, a judicial tool, not a tool in the hands of politicians who think they can use us when it's convenient or drop us when it is not. If we don't receive consistent and strong support from actors that shape international relations, such as the political leaders, international and regional organizations, as well as civil society organizations, the court will not be able to fulfill its mandate. And prospects of ending impunity and realization of international justice will become unlikely. As we celebrate <clears throat> our 10 year anniversary, the Rome Statute is extending. It is building network of actors around the world in order to maximize the prevention of massive crimes and to enforce common standards in situations where massive crimes falling within our jurisdiction are committed. Step by step, the Rome Statute system is moving ahead and it's creating a new international dynamic. It is impacting other institutions and it's changing international relations forever. The Rome Statute system is changing the balance of power between those few powerful individuals we talked about who thought they could get away with massive crimes and their victims. And as the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, I will continue to solidify this change. My office will continue to work towards putting an end to impunity and contributing to the prevention of future crimes. And we will use the full power of the law and will be guided only by the evidence and the legal criteria. I hope I can count on your support, the support of all of you present here today to achieve this change. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, an, an incredible talk, and I think especially uh, inspiring to our 1Ls uh, and to our students as they think about what they can do uh, with their legal degree and whom, whom is served by the law. Uh, we have time for questions, uh, so I'll open the floor. Um, raise your hands to uh, get our attention. Yes? Let us say you have a, a despicable 
and the leaders of that country are not willing to turn him over to you. How do you get this person to trial or to try and absentia? Uh, what is what are the methods do you use to go a counsel for the country to deliver up yeah. a um, I think an example that of, of this same situation will be President Bashir of Sudan. We have issued warrants against him, I believe, since uh, four years now, or five, uh, since 2005, I think. And uh, he's not been arrested. He is um, choosing the countries that he goes to. Um, so that he will not be arrested. Because the system that has been set up by the um, Rome Statute is that ICC as a court, we will do our investigations, we will do our prosecutions, we request for warrants from judges to issue, but the obligation to arrest is on states' parties. States' parties should implement the decisions of the, of the court. This is how the system is supposed to work. ICC has been created without an army and without police. But it is the police and armies of all these 121 states who should be working for the ICC. So it, it becomes difficult if the, 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 the states themselves do not arrest and surrender to the ICC. Um, as you can see with respect to Bashir, since the warrants were issued, he's still out there. The states' parties are aware that uh, he has to be arrested, but I guess for them also it is, uh, it is difficult. I have given the example of uh, Malawi, coming up to say that if Bashir comes to my territory, I will arrest and surrender to the ICC. Uh, we have um, countries like Botswana saying the same thing, uh, but he is choosing the countries that he will go to. And mostly it is countries that have not signed or ratified the Rome Statute and who feel that they do not have obligation to arrest, to arrest Bashir. So this is, this, is, this is the situation that we find ourselves. For us as a court, we cannot do much. You know, once, once we, the Office of the Prosecutor, present the evidence to the judges and the judges issue the arrest warrants, um, we, we just have to, have to wait for the warrants to be implemented. Um, if we see that a state or a country that has signed and ratified the Rome Statute is not living up to the expectation or the obligation of arresting Bashir, what we can do is to report back to, in this case, the UN Security Council and say that uh, country X or country Y has not. Uh, in other instances, we can also report back to the Assembly of States Parties, but that is uh, that is, a that is the limitation of the I ICC. Um, have you decided who your deputies are going to be at, and what kind of, like, what would be the three leading factors going into that decision and the process as we make that decision? Um, one of the first priority areas I, um, I, I said at the, once I assumed office was to pick uh, or at least to, to, to get a deputy also in place. Um, the, the, the statute, the Rome Statute, makes it easy, more or less, uh, uh, for me, um, by requesting that I present three names, three names to the Assembly of States Parties who will do the elections out of these three names. And the process has been on. Um, I think one of the first thing I, things I did was to put the advert out there that we are looking for a deputy. And I had um, 219 people applying. <laughs> so um, I, I, I put a panel together uh, in which we, we, we sort of sorted out, at least there were a few who were not, who didn't have even the basic Qualification. So we sorted that out and finally came out with a short list of 15. And I've done, together with the panel, I've done the interview of these people. They come from everywhere. And uh, we, we shortened it down to six. And again, interviewed the six. Uh, different process all the time. And uh, at the moment, I am studying the final report to be able to come out with the three. 
which I hope to submit to the Assembly of States Parties uh, by early September or next week. <laughs> but you know, with, with respect to the deputy, um, all the qualifications of the prosecutor, the deputy should possess as well. Uh, because some of the, uh, your, your duties and, and obligations that you have as a prosecutor can also be delegated to, to the deputy. So it's a person of high moral character, having um, experience and expertise in this area, things like that. Other questions? Yes. Does the International Court have any responsibility for those who have been falsely imprisoned or tortured? And also, how do you work with organizations like uh, Amnesty International? Um, Amnesty International is one of those international organizations uh, um, uh, and also part of civil society that we have had a very good working relationship with. Um, in fact, every, every year, twice a year, we have what is known as the NGO briefing in which all the um, non-governmental organizations come to the office, you know, we, we speak with them and we exchange uh, information and also give them some kind of predictability in what we are doing to assist them also in, in, in their work. And we also receive ideas you know, um, on, 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 what, on what we are doing. We share ideas. Um, the NGO community really have played a big role, as you know, even in getting the ICC established. And they continue to also play, play that role. Of course, our investigations and prosecutions are done by ourselves. Um, we do get information from them, which we can use as much as possible, because they also um, do have a mandate um, in which uh, they need to also ensure that their people are also protected, are not exposed. So we, we also have to make a balance between the way we use the information that they give us, or sometimes we use it as leads. For, for other other uh, information that would help our work, so we have a very good working relationship with the with the NGOs. You have uh, there was a question you asked about uh, torture. The, the first part of your question, um, you talked about. You know, um, maybe I should, I should just um, tell you that the, the ICC's jurisdiction is over crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes. And we, we don't just intervene any, anywhere. Uh, we have um, criteria, but we also um, intervene in um, when these crimes take place on the territory of a state party. Or we, we, we go after the crimes if they are committed by a national of a state party. And we intervene if the United Nations Security Council refers a situation to the ICC, as they've done in Libya and in Sudan. So within this limitation is where we are able to look, look, look at, at crimes. And sometimes our jurisdiction is, is, is triggered when the states request us to intervene, like even recently Mali did that. But also, if we see that these crimes are taking place where we have jurisdiction, we must have jurisdiction first, the prosecutor can also use uh, her proper motor powers to, to, <laughs> to start investigations. So, this, this, of course, could be crimes, but it would depend on whether we are able to intervene or not, depending on the limitations of our jurisdiction. Also, would you please uh, speak to how you're financed? Oh, we have um, 121 states' parties who've signed and ratified and are committed 
to making subscription. They, they finance the court. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the, yeah. Um, I think this has been a, a fear that, that people talk about, that states would refer uh, cases in the ICC only for their own convenience. But I think so far with the record that we have set, this danger should, should, should go away. Um, when Uganda requested uh, the court to intervene by referring a case, um, I think one of the first things that... Uh, uh, my predecessor did was to also tell them that we are not only going to focus on the crimes that have been committed by other parties, we will also look at. And just to give you the recent example, about two, three weeks ago, Mali came to my office to refer the situation in Mali. And uh, I was very clear in telling them that we are going to, of course, collect information and um, do a preliminary analysis of the situation but of the whole territory of Mali, not just uh, in the north where those crimes were taking place. And this was agreeable to them, and this is what the office will do. So I, I think that um, um, if the office allows itself to be used for these political reasons, then we lose our credibility. There is no need to continue. We need to do, we need to be guided by the evidence that we receive of these crimes and by the law that applies. But if we take into account political considerations, then I think that there is no need to set up an ICC. Other questions? Yes. What sort of um, security detail do you and your staff have? And have you had situations in which you've had reason for, uh, to be concerned about your safety or safety of others associated with the ICC? <coughs> Um, my security people say I shouldn't discuss it. <laughs> but, but you see, I, I think mostly is in, um, when we are most worried is in situations of ongoing conflict where we are investigating and prosecuting. Because um, not only the security of the staff becomes important, but also the victims, especially, and the witnesses who give us their stories. And over the past nine, 10 years, we have been investiga investigating in such situations. And one of the, uh, our main obligations is to ensure that those whom we talk to are also protected because we cannot expose them. So we, we, we do go in to investigate and we have to, at the same time to ensure that those people who talk to us are safe, but also our staff are safe. Um, for we, we, most of the time what we do is we use a lot of discretion in the sense that um, in our safe houses, for instance, where we, we, we talk to our individuals, um, it's, of course, not known. Um, sometimes even our presence on the ground is not known. You know, I remember in Uganda, we investigated for 10 months. And uh, when, we, when we brought uh, our request for warrants, Ugandans were saying that, but they have not even been here. How do they know? <laughs> so we, we, we try to do this. And also, we have the uh, Victims uh, and Witnesses Unit. We call it the VWU. You know, they, it is their expertise. We rely on their expertise to also be able to protect victims and witnesses whom we contact. But with respect to our own personal security, um, we work also very closely with uh, the, the states on the, the, the government on the ground to assist mainly with logistical, but also security for, for staff. So we, thanks. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, yes, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, 
Maybe we have time for two if we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Noah? Uh, yes, ma'am. I had a question about the, uh, the, the victim's fund. What, what steps are you taking to, I guess, kind of increase the size of that? Because no millions and millions of euros are spent on the prosecution of you know, basically the big fish. And mm -hmm. Um, you're talking about the Trust Fund for Victims. Um, the Trust Fund for Victims, uh, as you know, was created together with the ICC. It's, in that sense, it's an independent institution that has been created, but working on what ICC is doing to ensure that victims um, who are to receive reparation and compensation will do that. And I, I am aware that even before we come to a final decision, they are already on the ground. The, the Trust Fund for Victims is already on the ground looking for ways in which they can um, um, uh, see what are the best forms of reparation for, the, for that community. And you will, you will note the recent decision uh, after the Lubanga case, giving them the uh, responsibility to ensure that they deal with uh, reparations of, of victims of the Lubanga crimes. But um, as I said, even before then, they have been working in the Democratic Republic of Congo and I think in also U Uganda to see what are the little projects that can be, that can be used to help the affected, affected communities. Um, uh, uh, I think w what the court has done recently you know, is, is really um, a landmark in the sense that it is the first time at the international level that the court has now requested the trust fund for victims to take care of uh, the reparations of these victims. But I think um, the, 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 when it comes to the financing uh, of the victims, so far they have not you know, said anything, but I agree with you. I think that uh, we need to look again more carefully at how the the finances they have to be able to help these victims can be enhanced. And now you have the last question. Right. Um, earlier you spoke to the idea that um, a lot of the states in South America, Africa, and Europe were part of the Rome statute because they've been personally affected mm -hmm. uh, by certain types of crimes. Um, and I was just wondering what the message is when you have major international actors that are not part of the statute and how you plan to kind of combat any negative kind of message or Yeah, there are um, very big countries that have not <laughs> you know, that have not um, not not yet still part of the ICC. Um, but I, you know, with respect to that, as officials of the court, we, you know, this is a state policy. You know, if a state decides to join or not to join the ICC. It is a policy of that state. And maybe depending on timing or whatever reasons they have or that state has not to join um, the ICC yet, it is a reason that they have. Um, I, I always say that you know, maybe the timing is not right, but the ICC is permanent. So it's, it's still here. And perhaps uh, sooner or later, you know, they would find a way of, of joining the court. But uh, what, what I, can, I can say is that in spite of even be, not being members of the ICC, we have received uh, good cooperation and good support for the work of the court. And uh, here I would say with, even with the United States, uh, we have received uh, good cooperation um, with, with, with them. And uh, um, they have been, uh, I, I can say, assisting within their legislative limits what they can do with the court. This, um, and this has been also very, very useful. Likewise, with other states also who are not, not yet states parties, I believe they are coming. But uh, um, the, at least what we used to have, which was the you know, active uh, sabotage or propaganda against the court, is not, is not happening anymore. 
So we have the CICC, which is the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, that is working very hard and targeting countries to try to convince them uh, about the benefits of becoming part of the ICC. Because I think ultimately if we are able to achieve that, it would be a good thing for humanity. Thank you so much.